Okay, welcome back. It's Ben Joe, it's Bristol in the Blitz. Where am I stood? I'm at the top of a road here called School Road. All right, this road is Allison Road, as is this. It crosses over, it's kind of a uh, crisscrossy T junction, I suppose you'd call it, but it's crossroads really. Up here is a mini roundabout. Let me zoom in on that if I can get my zoom going. There we are. That's a mini roundabout up there. Now, to the right of that mini roundabout I just zoomed in on is Broomhill Road. So it would go across in that direction, if you can imagine where I'm pointing. Whereas if you carry straight on at that mini roundabout, you'll carry on straight down the hill. Now, why am I here? Well, um, if we travel down that Broomhill Road, that parallel road to where I am, if I'm going sort of parallel sideways now, just behind two of those houses where the two of those Luftwaffe bombs fell, and a little four, and that's where I showed you last night. And then another 400, 500 meters further away, directly the direction I'm looking, another 500 meters away, shall we say, was where that bomb crater pond is. It's where that bomb fell. Why am I here though? Well, in this direction, looking towards this waste ground, zooming in here, that waste ground down this road known as School Road, two more bombs fell, and then. If we travel up this way, you see, I'm just gonna move away from the traffic noise. This whole area, you see there's a church there, you see the cross. Over here is an area we call Brislington Meadows. And here, we know at least two bombs were mapped, probably three, um, and maybe more that were unexploded because I believe the bomb maps are only mapping exploded bombs, although I'm not certain on that. Um, but why am I here? Why is this road even called School Road? There isn't actually a school on it. The reason is, if we go down right to the bottom, and I would have taken us down there tonight, but frankly, I don't really want to, uh, given that the light is catching up with us. I guess just moving away from all the, the traffic noise a moment. Um, if we were to carry on down that hill, so in this direction down the hill, what we would find, there we are by the church now, we'd find a little cul-de-sac to the left. And that little cul-de-sac is called the Rock. And in there is an old Victorian building, but it's a very funny little building. It's kind of truncated. <laughs> All we have is a, little, is a little building that looks like a school building, but we don't have the rest of the school attached to it. Why is that? Well, if we look at the bomb map, we'll see why. Because we can see it received a direct hit somewhere between the 22nd and the 27th of February 1941. Now, these were quite early raids in terms of um, Bristol. We know Bristol was damaged um, September 1940 in the daytime blitz. We know it was attacked then. Then in 1941, we switched to those night raids, as we said before. And um, the heaviest raid on Bristol was the Good Friday raid, and that was the one that took out the tram. So I believe Good Friday that year was the 11th of, Feb uh, the 11th of April 1941. Um, Interestingly, how many, could this have been one bomber that did this? Just one stick of bombs? Well, the Heinkel HE-111 could carry eight 250 kilogram bombs. So it is in theory possible. One for the bomb crater, two for Broomhill Road, a couple for here, one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, so, you know, one could have done one, because they are all, if you look on the bomb map, map of Bristol, they are all pretty much in a straight line, interestingly. But given that we know that this area over here, I spoke of Brissington Meadows, has a number of unexploded bombs in it, and that's an issue for the developers who are wanting to build there now, um, clearly several bombers lost, lost their way. How was this possible? I mean, were the Germans using, you know, sextants and celestial navigation and this kind of thing? No, they were not. They had something called Nickelbein, or Nickelbeiner. Does it have an E on the end? Depends if it's masculine or feminine. Either way, Nickelbein is what we say in English, and it means bent leg. And we're not talking about Coogan Cassius here, no. We're talking about a navigation measure, an electronic navigation device, because the Luftwaffe found out very, very early that these uh, celestial navigation methods, the, the, almost like navigating at sea, it was the way the RAF was still doing it, uh, it didn't work. You might find a city if you're lucky, but half the time, you, you know, you know we're near. And there was a report called the Butt Reports, which came out, was that 1942, I forget the month, that showed, you know, most of the bombers were absolutely nowhere near their targets. It wasn't a matter of aiming, it was a matter of navigation. It was absolutely useless at zooming on the beautiful sunset, as opposed to that beautiful Volkswagen. So, 
actually that's not I have to hold my camera too steady um, but anyway yeah so what they were doing they were using this electronic navigation and so usually their bombing was extremely accurate um, it might be a problem with their equipment it might be that maybe only the squadron leader had the nickel buying equipment and if he dropped wrong then so would the others I would have to look into that non expert on Luftwaffe um, but anyway, that was how they got their bombs from Acura. And interestingly, we actually set up near Bristol, I believe it's somewhere called Chew Magnum, which is a lake outside the city. Nearby there, we set up a starfish site. And what that was, it was a site that had the ability to burst into flame with all these gas pipes and so on. They, they, they could turn it on, make a massive fire. The idea being that it could take the bombers away because we, foolishly, were assuming that the bombers were navigating like we were. And that, you know, if you see a fire, well, that's got to be the right place to bomb, yeah? So let's go drop our bombs there. Of course, how many bombs fell on the starfish site near Bristol during the duration of the whole war? Not one. So it didn't work, and the reason was because they were navigating by beams, so they weren't going to be drawn away by a fake fire. Um, so interestingly, of course, the blend was not just high explosive. The Germans had learned... Um, not well through bitter experience not for them but for the people on the ground at Warsaw in Poland you know in September of uh, 1939 um, in places like Amsterdam Rotterdam um, different place even earlier Guernica places they, they'd learned that what you do you use high explosives to smash up the houses a bit but you shower it with incendiaries and you start fires and it's the fires that cause the trouble and of course the Germans were ultimately paid back as Sir Arthur Harris Bomber Harris said they've sown the wind but they'll reap the whirlwind and of course they did so later on so we hear about these Hunker 111s carrying um, eight 250 kilogram bombs Junkers um, 88 could maybe carry four of that weight, so maybe one ton. Or, or So these were medium bombers. These were not heavy bombers. In fact, even the Junkers 88 turned almost into a fighter bomber uh, later on the war, and also a night fighter. So it's a stable platform, two-engined bomber. They didn't have a four-engined one appropriate for this use. Um, they did have a C, uh, large four-plane C bomber, uh, the Condor, but we won't go into that. Um, but in terms of this, the, later on, once the Lancaster had been built in the Halifax, these large four-engine bombers, what we could see then, Halifax would carry a cookie, okay, which is Grand Slam bomb. It's a 4,000-pound bomb, so roughly two tons, 2,000 kilograms. And that wasn't all it carried. It carried nearly as much as that in incendiary bombs. And they weighed four pounds each. So you could have, you know, hundreds of these things. Um, and... Uh, uh, and so you could imagine that these targets, even though we hear a thousand bomber raids like the one on Cologne in 42, this was not the norm. Usually the raids were a few hundred, maybe 150. But if you were dropping um, 4,000 pounds of high explosive and then another four or six, six thousand pounds of four pound incendiary bombs you can imagine you can start firestorms if you get a concentrated uh, drop of bombs and of course later on we had the pathfinders um, and we did have naviga navigational age like G uh, I believe was the first one uh, and they developed and of course later on we had um, we had short um, centimeter centimetric radar which was extremely useful as well um, HS2 was another of these navigational devices I forget, I forget which came to first that one or G um, but uh, that, I suppose, is why the area around me is still, by and large, standing, because they didn't have heavy enough bombers to saturate the area with incendiaries and burn the area to the ground. Maybe we'll take a look at that Victorian schoolhouse. I should have mentioned, I think I did already, the, house, the, the whole school smashed up. So School Road, <laughs> which is what we're looking at now, no longer has a school. Uh, but the little schoolhouse is, is still there. It's been turned into a little, little house, so it's um, part of part of it remains. But anyway, that's uh, Benjo in the Blitz. Thanks for anyone who listens.